Welcome to What a Word is Worth, a space for creative minds to speak about viable ways to heal the world through writing and other inventive mediums. This is your host, Marianela Medrano. I am the founder of Palabra Center, where words are giving us medicine. And that's our conversation here. That's what we want to explore is how words are medicine. And my guest today is a sister. Um, we share the same island and she was sent my way through poetry. So Danielle Legro George is a writer, translator, academic, and author of several books of poetry including the award-winning Dear Remote Nearness of You. And she is the queen of titles. If I were to share all her titles, you will see why I'm saying that. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you, Marianela. I'm very happy to be here with you. Yes. So um, I'm so, so happy as I was telling you as well. I'm like, giggly and, and, and happy to have this conversation with you. Um, so as I say at the beginning, this is a space for us to explore how words are both healing and transformative. Um, so probably you move more in the transformative kind of uh, realm or creating transformation through the work that you do, but I'm I'm pretty sure there is some healing. I know I access that um, when I heard your poetry. So my question is, how was your encounter with poetry to start with? And do you subscribe to this idea that poetry is a healing balm? Mm. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I believe poetry can be mm -hmm. a healing bomb. Um, I, I feel that there's great poetry, there's great um, power mm -hmm. in poetry. That poetry can serve as a mirror and also a telescope. I like that. A mirror and a telescope. Tell me more. Yeah, it allows us to see ourselves, to name ourselves, to, mm -hmm. to put words to the nameless and the formless, as yeah. Ward um, might say. She has this wonderful essay uh, published in 1977, in which she says, poetry is not a luxury, particularly for Black women. Mm -hmm. We live in, many of us live in societies that would have us not have voice, that would not see us. And so our ability to name ourselves, right, to give mm -hmm. to our feelings and emotions and experiences is absolutely necessary. So in that sense, um, I could say that it is, is uh, you know, poetry is, is, is healing because mm -hmm moves us away from um from a space in which we're not seen you yeah know, yeah we, we exist and and, mm -hmm. and can be seen um and then the, the idea of a telescope is that um speaks to the to the notion that poetry and the arts in general i think allows us mm -hmm. to envision what doesn't exist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the moment mm -hmm. um, and so I think it, it's uh, it's extremely powerful and useful in that way. Mm -hmm. at, at some at, in certain cultures and certain historical moments, you know, black people with agency, people of color with agency within mm -hmm. a broader context, right? Yeah, we're not allowed to exist, mm -hmm. and so to articulate it, to send it forth, to see it, to envision it, I think, mm -hmm. is a uh, speaks to the idea of you know the telescope and and a healing of of, of harm right yeah yeah inability to to uh, understand people in their full humanity 
Mm. And I, I'm, I mean, I love both the um, images that you're using, um, you know, the mirror that also uh, gives us back um, our reflection, right? And also what I'm thinking with the telescope, there is depth. It gives us depth. It gives, it creates depth for us to then um, appreciate more details. That's, can I borrow that? Yes. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> that is beautiful. Um, so how young did you start writing? Oh, um, you know, uh, I started writing as a kid mm -hmm. um, in grammar school. I happened to have had great teachers, great grammar mm -hmm. teachers who encouraged uh, us to, you know, the kids uh, in their classes to write, mm -hmm. uh, gave us really great books to read, mm -hmm. right? And then right from, you know, right now we're dealing with the question of censorship and yeah. Yeah. students are allowed to, to learn and to say. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to have had great teachers who, who um, taught me a great deal and allowed me to express myself through writing. Uh, and, and also, um, I think writing for me as an immigrant kid in the United States was really important, it was a place in which I, I could see myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, the, in these um, environments in which I was negotiating different va value systems, different mm -hmm. worlds, like two, three, four different kinds of worlds and so writing in my little diary you know, in my little journal um, was really useful yeah I started as a child how old were you when you came to I was six when I you came were to the United States yes you were six six yes wow that's a crucial age yes yeah uh-huh yeah. yeah so the diary was there to hold your questions and your what else was that diary holding oh questions and fears what is in the closet <laughs> <laughs> what is under the bed <laughs> yeah yeah what can i eat uh -huh. <laughs> really fundamental questions <laughs> mm -hmm. important for the survival though yes <laughs> yeah so Let's go um, directly to one of your poems, um, Hostage. Yeah, I, I heard in, in a presentation you did um, that you wrote it in, in response uh, to being, I guess, diasporized, <laughs> to be made. Um, and I, you know, that really resonated with me because whenever I am boxed in, you know, as part of the diaspora, I'm like, what? I don't know what to do with that. But um, I heard you say that you wrote it as a response to that label. Can you tell more about your sense of being labeled or boxed as diaspora? And, and what did that poem um, did for you? Sure. Because that's what poems are good, right? They do things for us. Yes, yes. Um, you know, for me, poems uh, tend to be a space of inquiry. Mm -hmm. so I, I was, uh, as a young adult, I uh, began to return to Haiti after, you know, growing up here in the United mm -hmm. States. And I always uh, understood myself as Haitian, mm -hmm. uh, American as well, but, but, but you know, first Haitian, mm -hmm. uh, proud Haitian. Uh, uh, and uh, I went back to Haiti and I was identified and labeled diaspora. Mm -hmm. So yes, Haitian, but. <laughs> yeah. But hyphenated or not entirely or Haitian and. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is when the term was really beginning to move into, um, you know, popular discourse. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I um so you know it it uh, the the poem was a way to examine that uh, my relationship to my ancestral land mm -hmm. 
and how I was perceived in the ancestral land relative to or juxtaposed with my own understanding of self. So, so this is really how that poem emerged. Mm. Yeah, and you know what I'm thinking and often feel is that the concept of the diaspora in in a way is it's is a form of otherizing us. We become the other, we become the one who left. And some of us didn't have a choice. Um some of us did it. I mean, some people might say I did it as a choice because I was, you know, I was in six. Um, you know, I was in my 20s when I decided to come here. Um, but that doesn't, I mean, I'm still from there. I'm not the other. I'm not the diaspora. Right. I mean, it is not an unproblematic term. It is a, it's mm. a complicated term. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it has some positive aspects connected to it, and it has some 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 aspects that we, that we may want to challenge. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it, on one level, it, it it represents the the nation a nation ness and yeah. and the extension of that nation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, beyond its 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 borders. Mm -hmm. and that's the question of borders too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm has created them, what they represent, and so on. What they represent, right. Um, and there's also the question of how the diaspora helps to float or to um, support the, mm -hmm. the, the nation. Mm -hmm. With uh, the Haitian diaspora, there, I mean, ha Haitians in the diaspora um, and, you know, are involved in sending remittances back home and supporting right folks back home. So there are these very complicated mm -hmm. I mean, I think there has to be a way to um, recognize, you know, those of us who don't live the reality mm -hmm. of the country, right? I'm thinking about Haiti right now, and it's experiencing great, great, great difficulty, right? Yeah. And we have to deal with that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. right? so and, and Danielle, you're referring to the tension, the violence, the yeah. The gangs, the, mm -hmm. you know, the the instability, the governmental instability, and so mm -hmm. on. Right? Mm -hmm. but after the um, the assassination of the, yeah. the president of Moise last summer, but right. we encountered difficulty even well before then. Right? right. I don't have to deal with you know the gas, mm -hmm. this, this, mm -hmm. that, and the other thing, and yet claim my Haitianness, right? Mm -hmm. deal with the difficulties so it's it's a very complex conversation absolutely around the diaspora yeah because it touches what's happening and, and it is true the country has not been able to recover its balance since last year it's been this roller coaster so that gets to you I mean it gets to me I'm imagining what it does to you and how then you're not looking um, at that as an outsider. You're feeling with the country, correct? Absolutely, yes, yeah. yeah. But not living it, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not forced to live the sort of the quotidian pressure, the daily yeah. pressures, right? Yeah. People living in the country uh, have to. Uh, yeah, have yeah. To and maybe, I mean, if we look at, you know, like, let's stay with literature, what can signal um, or represent the, the literature of the diaspora is perhaps that because we are not there, there is certain freedom of expression that people who are in the island, be that, you know, in Haiti or the Dominican Republic, they cannot say things that perhaps for us, we have the luxury going back again to say it here. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, you know, um, the 1970s and uh, early part of the 1980s mm -hmm. and, and even before then in Haiti, mm -hmm. when, um, 
the, the dictator, François Duvalier, really uh, attempted to destroy civil um, society. Absolutely. And, um, so uh, like every good dictator autocrat, he mm -hmm. began to um, jail, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. disappeared. People mm -hmm. who could respond to what was going on in the country at the time. Right? Yeah. And so yeah. as a result, we had some, you know, uh, uh, we had great emigration mm -hmm. and folks in the diaspora who could speak to, who could mm -hmm. respond to, who could challenge, who could protest against Duvalier when it was extremely dangerous in Haiti. To mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. So that's what hostage um, gave you a voice and he helped you kind of reclaim mm -hmm. a space will you say? Yeah. Or at least express, hey. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That, yeah. That even if, if I'm called diaspora, um, I, I'm still connected and I, um, I, I, I don't accept so easily the negative mm -hmm. aspects of that label. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, do you have the poem in front of you by any chance? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> I, I'm wondering if there is, a, you know, a line or two from the poem or a stance that you, you feel um, gave you the strength that you were looking for. Like, where is the force for you as, as the poet, right? Like, for me, it's many lines, but for you as the poet, when you... When you read the poem, where do you feel most sustained? Sure. Um, I think um, where I feel most sustained occurs near the end of the poem. There's a, there's a reference to returning and then encountering um, my cousin and her small daughters, mm -hmm. uh, one of whom says that, uh, you know, who accuses me of not being able to speak the language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And, you know, children, they will, yeah. they will say very truthful things or things they believe to be truthful. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just read to you a few lines. And then yes, please. About it. So return to now, a cousin once removed and former playmate visits with her daughters. They are strangers to me. Estelle, La Petite, with adult teeth, explains. Auntie's sad because she cannot chew our words. I bite one to prove something to her. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. That was actually um, one of the parts of the poem that really grabbed me. I'm so glad that you chose that. I'm going to um, hello, kid. <laughs> yeah, right. So. Um, I want to go to another one of your poems. And um, it's a, a poem, you know, the such a necessary poem. And that is a um, poem for the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And you remind us not to box Haiti on a stereotype. Mm. Um, and you know, I even found an old blog of mine where I used the description back in 2010. I use it. I'm writing a blog um, because that was the best I could do after the disaster there. I was like, I, I felt like I couldn't breathe. I was really impacted and felt so powerless that I just went and, and wrote the, uh, the blog for the American Counseling Association. And I used the term there. And that is a good example of how intent is not what matters, right? But impact. Mm. Because my intent was, you know, I have to do something for my brothers and sisters in Haiti. So I wrote the blog to 
call other therapists to be aware and how to respond and, you know, trauma and whatever. But then I was, you know, language was in a way um, betraying me or I was betraying language. I don't know which one. Um, it was a call to action yet, um, you know, I was using language that perpetuated a myth. So, so it's two things. I want us to talk about the poem, but I'm also curious, can you think of instances where old writings show blind spots to you? Mm. And I don't know, you might not have that, but I know that one, you know, for me it's like, and I'm not, I could actually choose to get it erased, but I don't want to do that because it's a reminder for me okay. of the, um, you know, how intent and impact, you know, we have to focus more on the impact than the intent. Yeah, but we also evolve. Right? Yeah. We yeah. also evolve individually as writers. We evolve um, within cultures, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We evolve within diasporas, yeah. within geographies. And so, um, you know, that, that, that label or that, that um, suffix, had mm -hmm. accompanied Haiti for a mm -hmm. long time, and people are still using that. So, mm -hmm. I'm glad mm -hmm. that you're aware that mm -hmm. that you used it, but probably are not using that suffix anymore, or right. are not using it without problematizing it. Mm -hmm. So we 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 evolve, and I think that's part of our job as um, healers, mm -hmm. right? as as people who who uh, deal in language to. Mm -hmm question language to yeah. create new language and thereby create new new vision and mm -hmm. new vision, mm -hmm. right? I mean we can say Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere we can say that that's not a lie but you know I'm thinking about uh, Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie's um, you know, notion of the danger of a single story connected to a group. Yes, story. Right. right. We right. can say that. Mm -hmm. Also, as we say that, we should also ask why Haiti mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. in the Western Hemisphere, why it has been impoverished. We, Haiti is almost next door to one of the most wealthy countries in the, the world. How can this exist? How can this great disparity exists. How can mm -hmm. there be in Haiti people with enormous wealth and people who are so, um, who are struggling to live mm -hmm. every day and to send mm -hmm. them to school and to, to feed themselves and to feed their kids, right? And to mm -hmm. feed, right? So, how, how, so I think it's important to, to, to ask why. The, mm -hmm. why Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And then that cracks open a whole host of other questions. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the, the debt, like racism, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, governmental instability, like foreign intervention in, in mm -hmm. governmental affairs, right? Mm -hmm. so, so really um, cracking open labels or cracking open stereotypes, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Um, cracking open easy ways to like identify things I think is really mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and is important too yeah and and like you said before the um, the poem as a space of inquiry and, and problematizing right like, and which is what you so beautifully do with this uh, with this poem and you know you were mentioning some of the, the whys. Um, and I'm actually working right now on a presentation um, for the Dominican Studies Association annual conference. And I'm talking about the impact of the colonized mind in, um, in public life, in governmental, um, actions, because most of our politics are coming from a very patriarchal, you know, colonist mindset, 
Yes. So when we look at the white, we have to look. When, when we contextualize, why is Haiti that? Why is Dominican Republic a poor country as well? The context is going to point in many directions. And I absolutely. think that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and then offer yeah. up, you know, in addition to sort of thinking about sort of the why of, mm -hmm. of, of Haiti's impoverishment, um, thinking, thinking about what else, Right? Or what other? Mm -hmm. Or what before? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I started going back to Haiti, I, I absolutely just fell in love with Haiti. Mm -hmm. Felt a great ease. Mm -hmm. uh, I started going back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Ease, uh, because I would, you know, I, I, I live in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, grew up in Boston, uh, in a segregated Boston, mm -hmm. uh, and would go to Haiti and just would relax because I was in essentially a black country. So I have to think about my blackness all the time. Absolutely. Not and if you I, didn't, right. if you didn't, I'm imagining it was put here right. <laughs> in case. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, and just you know love haitian culture love the haitian the haitian haitian people my haitian mm -hmm. relatives just uh it was just a whole different way of being mm -hmm. haitian ontol ontological stances you know just mm -hmm. relationships it was just a whole different thing mm -hmm. um, and so you know thinking about that poem i, I thought i know a haiti that is not the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, yeah. not only marked by its impoverishment, right? It's not only marked by its lack, it's marked by its amazing, extraordinary, rich culture, by its arts traditions, by history. great history, great beauty. Um, some of the most beautiful things I've seen, I've seen in Haiti, some of the most awful things I've seen, I've seen in mm -hmm. Haiti uh, mm -hmm. as well. So. Mm -hmm you know, a, a, a bigger picture, a broader sense of what, you know, a place like Haiti is. And every place is a complicated place, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just X, or it's not just Y, it's all of it. Yeah, yeah. If I'm always curious, and you pointed before, you said, yeah, that's evolution, right? We're constantly evolving. Um, what year did you write that poem? Uh, more or less no right after the earthquake it was in 20, uh, 2010 okay so that was your way so we, we were both uh, responding yeah. in different ways um if you were to rewrite it what will you include yeah. if anything that's a great question um for poem for the poorest country mm-hmm hmm, hmm. Do you have it in front of you? I do, it's, yes. It's not long. Do you mind reading it? No, I will read it. Okay. I will read it. Poem for the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Oh, poorest country, this is not your name. You should be called beacon. You should be called flame. Almond and Bougainvillea, garden and green mountain, villa and hut. Girl with red ribbons in her hair, books under arm, charmed by the light of morning. Charcoal seller in black skirt circled by dead trees. You country are the merchant woman and the eager clerk, the grandfather at the gate, at the crossroads, with the flashlight, with all in sight. Um, your question is, is really interesting. And what, what would I add or what would I change? I, I wouldn't. Okay. 
only because it was written in a moment. Mm -hmm. right? It was responding to a moment. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, maybe, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I would add a wish mm. for, for the country or yeah. for people uh, yeah. uh, dealing with the challenges yeah. of the country. Mm. Like, yeah, I'm always curious, right? Because I'm, oh my God, I have this internal editor that never finish, you know, pointing things. Um, so I'm always curious. But, but you know, like like you said, there are poems that we look at them and, and we said, no, I will write, you know, another one, but this one is done. Maybe this is one. <laughs> yeah, and then, of course, I mean, I think, you know, back to that 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 point about evolution. I think mm. we evolve, right? I, I that's I think that is our. I think I'll dare say I think that's our job. Yeah, to, to evolve. Yeah, to to evolve mm -hmm. as individuals, you know, but also as artists. Right? Yeah, we we learn this in this poem, mm -hmm. we learn that, and then we can go back. So if I change the poem, then it wouldn't. It would be disconnected from the moment, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. You, know. you know, and from the um, as a psychologist, I work. You know, I use a lot of the psychology of parts, right? And what I um, I emphasize to people is that it's it's we don't lose our parts. We don't want our parts to go away. We want to be able to recognize that our system is made of parts and that each part has a job and a time to exist. And that the job of the self is to recognize that and to protect the parts. So it goes to what you were saying that, you know, once something is said, we don't have to do anything with it, but we can transcend it. Mm. Right. And included. And, and this is actually not my idea, but there is an, an American philosopher, Ken Wilber, who speaks about this idea of growth as um, this transcending and including. So when you move to the next thing, you're including everything yeah. that made the, the previous one. Yeah, that, that, that's a great, great point. You know? mm -hmm. That's a great yeah. point. And yeah. I mean, I think we ought to be responsible for our work. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely. We can say, okay, I was thinking this then. Yeah. Then, now. Right. right. Yeah. Instead of like doubling down. And I think that would right. be a problem. Like, no, I'm not going to, no. Right. So. Yeah. So, and, and going back to the idea, and I don't know if you subscribe to it, but this idea that the there is a grip, a, a colonial grip that is still really stopping us uh, at many la levels. So how do you think, like imagine you're talking to your students, how do we create the colonial texts that can free us from the burdens of history, from the burdens of even intergenerational trauma, right? Um, that to me is like that revision that you're talking, that evolving that you're talking is about um, seeing the past in order to move and the movement has to be freeing. So what, how do we, what do you say to your students in terms of decolonizing our language? language? It's a good question. It's a tough question. Mm. Um, how do we decolonize our language? By, um, I think there are a number of things we can do. One, understanding the degree to which some language is, is um, problematic and carries. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Carries destructive ideas. Mm -hmm. Just the mm -hmm. other day, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing 
an abecedarian, which is a type of poem that relies on the alphabet, right? Yep, yep, yep. Um, and uh, so I decided I was going to read the entire dictionary. <laughs> and of course, of course, I'm going through the A's and the B's, and then I get to black, of course, of course. And I'm not the only one who has, is, has made the statement that I'm going to make. And there's a litany of all of this, all of these negative terms associated with black. And of course, I flip through the white. I, yeah. I, know, right. I know what I'm going to find, and then the litany of purity and pristineness and all of all of that. And I'm thinking, this is 2022. Mm -hmm. like, why hasn't there been, you know, the committee to reconsider the definitions found in dictionaries associated with the term black, right? Like, why hasn't that happened? Why haven't we done this yet, right? It seems kind of like a basic thing that ought to happen. Yeah. But we haven't done it because nobody has, uh, you know, so far, or mm -hmm. to my knowledge, decided that we're going to just do this on a whole scale level, right? Yeah, yeah. Because all of these terms are like coming, like freighted mm -hmm. weight, all the stuff coming from, yep. you know, yep. 1737 or... <laughs> or all we carry. All yeah. Before, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really the um, willingness to, to, um, to think about things at that, mm -hmm. level, at that level, at the level. Mm -hmm etymology, you know, structural levels, and we can't do it all the time. It would be exhausting, right? Mm -hmm. But to really ha have that sort of foremost, to be mindful of how we think, mm -hmm. how we think, mm -hmm. you know, um, thinking about epistemology, I think is mm -hmm. really important as educators, as yeah. psychologists, right? Thinking about epistemic violence, like Absolutely. how we know what we know, mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. aware of mm -hmm. And that wise? Yes, right? So I think, you know, beginning there, like mm -hmm. mindfulness of how we move through the world, how we think about things, mm -hmm. and how we speak about things. Mm -hmm. This is what poets do. You're a poet. I'm a poet. We're, we're like, we're re, you know, we're like at the, I would argue, we're, the poets are at the avant-garde of language, right? We're mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. it fresh. Like, we're, you know, Poetry doesn't do cliche unless you're like reinscribing cliche, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we, we all, we all, most of us use language, right? We need to use language in order to communicate. Um, so there has to be some kind of level of being able to rely on language. Yeah. But we also, um, in that is some danger. So we are the people, the poets, you know, the thinkers are the people who are thinking about language and, you know, wrestling with it throwing it out into mm -hmm. a, a new way and mm -hmm. space. and then of course you know things move along mm -hmm. so, um i i hope i have answered your question yeah no no i think you're going um i mean it's resonating with me in the sense that as poets we can you know decolonize and dismount things by using language that is daring, that is refresh, uh, the repurposing of language, I guess, is what you're talking about. Um, and, I, you know, this is bringing me to another topic that I don't want us to not talk about, because I've been grappling with it since I'm a little girl. And, and it is the relationship between um, our nations. Um, I, I see our countries, and I'm not the only one. Um, this has been said before. It's the the wings of the same bird, and um, we have a history of connection, of shared revolutions that were trampled primarily by the old sentiment of totally disconnection and a myth of uh, separation that, that we carry and that became louder and louder, right? As the year go, um, went by. So I know, and I'm saying since I'm a little girl, I was very aware of Haiti. Um, 
my father used to tell the story of, as a teenager, his best friend was Nande, a boy from, from Haiti, who was apprehended by the military and sent back to Haiti. And my dad used to tell this story um, how Nande gave him his machete and said, Rico, he used to call, my father's name was Ricardo, but he used to call my dad Rico. And uh, he says, Rico, take care of my machete. Mm. I, I, even, I have a poem about that because it really it spoke to me about the, the beautiful friendship. But then I, I, as I, and then I, I grew up with a lot of Haitians, you know, working for um, my father also in the land. He often told that story with such love and also, as I grew up, I began to also hear other things that were in his language. Like, for instance, his favorite politician was um, Jose Francisco Peña Gomez, who was of um, Haitian descent. Mm -hmm. And my dad who used to say, He's only black on the outside, but he's pure whiteness inside, right. right? So I began to hear both. And that's what like piqued my curiosity, like, hmm? like what? So yeah. thank God that he said that and that I saw that and that he also shared that history of love. So I've always been curious about how do we mend how do we kind of salvage, salvage this um, beautiful connection that we have historically? And then how do we work with the, these connections, right? Like, you know, I, I, do you get my question? Because it, it, it's a... Yes, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I think I understand your question. Yeah. Um, you know... Uh, and in some ways, your in some ways, your question contains part of the answer too. Mm -hmm. uh, that we do have uh, uh, that we do. There are certain aspects we share. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. sort of share a, a territory, and I. Yep. Yep. We share a history. Mm -hmm. We share culture. Mm -hmm. Our indigenous roots. <laughs> it's like you can't pull them. Indigenous roots. We also share, those are some positive aspects. Um, some of it can be negative as well. We also share a history of oppression, mm -hmm. you know, through a white supremacist sort of um, force yeah. that we have to contend with and which yeah. has which affects, which has affected our countries mm -hmm. uh, in similar and dissimilar ways, mm -hmm. right? Trujillo, for example, bought white supremacy and enacted. He embodied it. Embodied and enacted, right? And acted out of mm -hmm. white supremacy to the detriment of. Yeah. Of Haitians, and we're absolutely with well, very aware of that. And so, understanding the ways, I, I so this has to do. I'm an educator, so I think education is really key to mm -hmm. understanding and teaching our history mm -hmm. and the ways in which we we have been affected by white supremacy. And white supremacy is not limited to the DR. It's not limited to hate. I mean, it's all it, you know. It's infected mm -hmm. the entire world. Right? Mm -hmm. And so how we, how, how we decolonize our own minds, mm -hmm. how we decolonize the ways we engage with one another, yeah. how we recognize um, how some of us have been privileged as a result of white supremacy, I think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And having such um, exchange mm -hmm. like these, you know, uh, I, th I think is, is, is really, really um, 
is really important. Yeah. And then, and then, and then responding to policies um, that have at their base, um, you know, white supremacy, which, which serves, you know, uh, certain economic models, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking uh, about the, the 2013 um, Dominican constitutional court ruling that yep. citizenship of not Haitians, no, that's the thing. That, yeah, that's that's the yeah, that's the painful truth. Right? Yeah. And so speaking this mm -hmm. and attempting to repair this, right? Bearing mm -hmm. witness. Bearing witness is important. It's you know, we're not policy, I'm not a policymaker. I won't speak right. for you. <laughs> I don't make policy, I'm not a politician, I'm not a legislator, uh, you know. Uh, I'm not a diplomat. I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a poet. Mm -hmm. Well, hence, right? We I, have that. We can write poems about this. Mm -hmm. to make people more aware, right? Mm -hmm. We can write poems as Rita Dove did about the 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 perejil mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, situation and, and yeah. the ensuing massacre. Yeah, as yeah. Maricely Agnon has, as others have, mm -hmm. um, and. We can, um, as you know, and speak truth as you have, right? Right. right. So, so I think uh, this is kind of what this is our work. If you yeah. choose it, yeah. And I think yeah. it's, I think it's important. Um. So exchange. I, I think that yeah, that is so important, right, for us to. First, as you say, decolonize the language, but also use poetry or whatever genre we write in as the way to then speak up. Because if we stay silent, then where are we going as an island? Like what's going to happen to us? And I do think, you know, again, borders are just inventions, right? That uh, just create pain, but we are an island. Yeah, um, yeah, we we yeah. are. So I think we need to continue having these exchanges, working together, voicing, yeah. you know, voicing what is taking place. Yeah, and and I agree with you in terms of you know the importance of education and at so many levels. I was um, reading a paper that our colleague Sophie Marinez uh, wrote, um, where she highlights how Haitian American writers are excluded from Latinx um, studies, right? So um, as someone in the classroom, you know, Sophie is in the classroom. I mean, she's not just a researcher, but she's in the classroom and she's always using the classroom as a platform to inform. Um, I'm not so much in the classroom, even though I, I do teach whenever I have a chance, but even, from the therapeutic seed, <laughs> um, I use information to, to change, to, to create a, a consciousness and awareness at all levels, right? And that's the only way we're going to get to freedom is right now we are in prison by self-hatred, by this myth of the other. Um, yeah. Do, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think, you know, you're speaking to epistemic violence and responding to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we are almost at the end. Have I, is there something I didn't ask that you want to share with the audience? Or is there anything that I asked that you want to kind of go back and um, expand or... It's your space. I know. I have. I have very much appreciated your your questions and and your comments and your the simpatico I feel mm -hmm. you know, from you. Mm -hmm. Simpatica. Can I say that? <laughs> yes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Um, well, no. I'll just remind, I guess, you and and the viewers that I have a, a book of translations. That was published in 2021 of um, the poems of a woman named Ida Faubert, 
Uh -huh. She was writing in the early part of the 20th century. She's Haitian and French. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, their translations from the French, they're very um, flowery. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hence the name. <laughs> um, Art. Yes. So I'm going to throw one last question then that comes from that. As a translator, um, do you choose what you translate and do you see yourself as a mediator slash creator uh, when you translate? Yeah. Yes, I do choose what I translate. And mm -hmm. so far I have um, only translated, no, that's not true, but in terms of books, I've been translating Haitian women poets. Mm -hmm. I feel that Haitian women poets are uh, not getting a lot of attention. Traction. <laughs> Being one myself, I mm -hmm. think that it is my duty to <laughs> make known uh, the work of my Haitian sisters, uh, you know, across time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, do I consider myself a mediator? I. Um, and I'm saying mediator in the sense that by translating, you are relanguaging or maybe repurposing language and calling attention to the areas that, as you said, have not been noticed. So that's what I'm, I'm saying when I talk about the mediator part. Yeah, well then, yes, um, mm -hmm. as, an, as an advocate for this mm -hmm. work, right? Yeah. Um, you know, to add to the, to add to what's available to the, to add to the available knowledge around mm -hmm. what comes out of Haiti, um, including mm -hmm. the poems written by these incredible women. Mm -hmm. And um, mm, yeah, uh, you know, one has to be respectful of the original text, of course, but then one has to make the, the, the text, uh, you know, I have to take a, a poem written in French or written in Haitian or yeah. Creole yeah. Mm -hmm. and make it a poem in English. So yeah. in some ways there has to be a kind of a leap. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. Yeah, there is certain freedom that you have to have. Now this poet is not available for you to go back and forth. <laughs> right. That's true. And that's, that, that's a little, uh, you know, challenging. Um, but it's freeing too. <laughs> it's true. And right now I'm translating a, um, a living poet, Marie-Célie Agnon, who lives uh -huh. in Montreal. And so that's been really, really interesting. And I've been in conversation with her, which has been wonderful. I consider that a real gift to be able to speak to somebody whose work. I'm, I'm yeah. I look forward to, to reading that. And also, you know, I'm, I've been dreaming about these um, gathering of Caribbean writers um, that I want to make happen, but have no resources, but all the love in the world and the dreams to make it happen. And maybe we can kind of celebrate your translations there. But thank you. Thank you for giving this time to us. And I hope our conversation won't end here, but that is going to be expanded. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So thank you for listening to What a Word is Worth. You can access different versions of today's interview at Anchor, YouTube, and other platforms. And if you are interested, hit the subscribe button in my um, channel, my YouTube channel and the podcast as well. And also, if you find our program beneficial, leave us a review. Let us know what we're doing well or what you, what you would like for us to expand. I am with you in love and compassion always, always. <laughs>